Vacuum casting, does this suck in a good way or a bad way? I'm on a mission to add investment casting to my maker toolbox and vacuum casting is the next step. But let's take a step back. What is investment casting? Well, an old definition of the word invest, to invest is to surround something or cover it. In investment casting, you surround the pattern with like a plaster or a ceramic. And sure, you surround patterns in sand casting too with sand, but in sand casting, you generally remove the pattern before you pour. In investment casting, you melt or burn out that pattern. It's a little more destructive, but you can ignore things like uh, like draft. You can generally do smaller things with much finer detail, and you can't reuse the plaster or the ceramic like you reuse the sand. So there are like you know pluses and minuses to everything, right? So how does the vacuum improve things? Well, uh, when you pour metal into a mold, there's air in there. The air's got to get out. You generally need vents. Or with sand casting, it can escape through the sand. Last time I did investment casting, I used like I used air vents. There were air channels for the air to get out, and I was kind of banking on gravity to like do the heavy lifting of like pushing the metal down into the mold. Good old gravity. But this plaster is porous, so the vacuum sucks air through the plaster. So when you pour the metal in, the air that gets trapped in there, and some always gets trapped in there, it doesn't hold the metal back. The vacuum sucks the air out, so the atmospheric pressure pushes the top in because it wants to equalize. Okay, and. Then that ends up pushing the metal into little finer details that you wouldn't otherwise get. This helps also because the metal isn't runny like water. It's more it like balls up. It's got a surface tension. Even if there wasn't air stopping it, it wouldn't want to flow into the little details. But we want it to flow into the little details because they look cool. Some people use like centrifugal setups that spin everything around and use centrifugal force to like force the metal deeper in. But you'll see kind of, well, later on in the future why I went with the vacuum instead of that. Oddly enough, it's safety. I'm not saying spin casting setups are dangerous, but what I want to do with it is definitely dangerous. That's not today though. So the vacuum today is supplied by this thing, this gigantic thing that's too big to fit in the shot. This is a vacuum casting machine you can buy. I intended to build one and I still do eventually, but it was, it was taking too long and I kind of want to keep moving here. So I just got this thing, got it from Vivor. The cheapest place I found to get it is on, it's from the Vivor website, not Amazon. Vivor sells this on Amazon. A bunch of people sell these on Amazon. The Vivor website, if you go there, if you like make an account and uh, there's also a coupon code down below, if you're interested, that bumps the price down. I think it's the cheapest place you can get one of these. Anyways, there's a vacuum pump in there and I had to fill that with vacuum oil. Don't forget that part. Fortunately, I had some laying around. So on off switch, turns the vacuum on. This is just pressure gauge and you can direct the vacuum. Do you want the vacuum for the investment table over here on the left? Release, which gives you both to release the pressure or the casting chamber. Big heavy switch. It also comes with this. This is a three and a half inch perforated stainless steel flask and I'm gonna test it out. So to make this as scientific, heavily in finger quotes here. I'm gonna do a flask almost exactly as I did it the last way. As close as possible anyway. And then I'm also gonna use the perforated one because it's fancy and better. I'm gonna try to go over the process kind of quick just in case you didn't see the last video, but go watch it if you feel like. First, the parts are 3D printed. Traditionally, wax was used for this. I didn't do that. I have a, a wax-based resin that burns out clean called Psoriatech Cast Purple. I tried burning some of this next to burning some just regular resin, and the regular resin left behind this hard, crunchy ball of ash, and the Psoriatech Cast Purple didn't leave anything away. It just burned completely away. You do not want all that ash and crusty junk in the mold. It screws up the surface finish. For printing, I use a Uniformation GK2. Any modern like resin printer will print this resin, but it's kind of tricky. It's it's got it's it's got some quirks to it, right? Because it's just packed full of wax. And the weather here is cooling off. So all summer it was like 80 degrees in here, ish, 80, 85 Fahrenheit. Every printer, every resin, it all seemed to work just fine. Uh, but as soon as the temperature started to dip like into the 50s, especially 50s overnight, and I print overnight a lot. Uh, I started having problems, except while printing with the Uniformation GK2. That machine has a resin heater. It heats up the tank of resin. If it's too cold, it heats it up. So you get consistent prints every time. I didn't think it was gonna be that big a deal until it was like freezing out here, but turns out the difference between 85 Fahrenheit and 55 Fahrenheit is enough to cause problems. So this resin is like 70, 75 bucks a bottle. I can't afford to waste too much of it on it just being a bit chilly. So I'm only gonna use the Uniformation printer from now on for this resin. Also, it prints really well. The prints look really nice. Seriously, it's a tricky resin, but I had zero failures printing. It's printed like 20 things to try with this. Not a failure, not a one. Processing prints with a special resin is a bit complicated. Uh, washing it's a chore, so is curing it. I'm not gonna go over the whole process. There are plenty of guides out there. I would suggest checking out Vogman's guide on this resin. 
it's good stuff. Just follow what he says. Now to make these molds, you have to attach everything to a big sprue. The big sprue is like the big channel in the middle that the metal flows in and then from there into the, into the pattern of the parts you actually wanna make. Last time I used a glue stick for this and then kind of just glue stick the resin things together. So that's what I did this time in the same rusted out two inch pipe flask just for science. It's not ideal but I could go in and steal it from the uh, craft shelf in the kitchen. So far, my wife hasn't noticed. Well, she's probably used to it by now. The only difference that I did uh, is I, I ran a couple of air channels up the, up the inside here. Now that's kind of to, to get the vacuum spread out a little bit more evenly. Otherwise, it's gonna have a lot of vacuum pressure at the bottom, not so much at the top. Run some channels up, that tends to help, or so in I've seen in tests, and hot glued those on. For the perforated flask, because it's big and fancy, I got the right stuff. This comes with a cap that has a little hole in it to put a sprue in. I got, I think it's a 10 millimeter big wax sprue, a big pack of them. Here it is. The stuff's kind of cheap too. I was surprised. Then I got a bunch of little, little straws. I think these are one millimeter around. These are like two and a half mil. And I got a little wax pen to do the melting, this little double A battery. This reminded me a lot of TIG welding. So it's got this little tip on the end, little button, a little double A battery. You hit the tip, the tip gets hot. You have one of these tiny things in your other hand, you can do press button for heat, filler rod, just like a TIG welder. Only very tiny and again, smells like birthday cake candles. Kind of neat. This was surprisingly easy to do, I thought, especially because I was way over caffeinated when I was doing this, like shaking like crazy. You know, you go to like a breakfast joint and every time the waitress goes by, she's just holding the pot of coffee and she just tops up your cup. That's what happened. You can even get like melt through and undercuts and joints if you were giving it too much heat. And it's just like TIG welding, tiny, tiny TIG welding. You get it too hot, it smells a little more like birthday candles. Happy birthday, you just burned your finger. Now I'm a beginner when it comes to making these molds, but I heard if you have the, the wax closer than a half inch to the bottom of the plaster, you might get a blowout. And vacuum blowout when molten metal's involved doesn't sound fun. So I followed that like to the letter and I followed no other guidelines. Okay, now to the plaster. I used Prestige Optima. It's a plaster designed for investment casting, specifically if you're using molds made out of plastic or resin, like I'm doing here. You can also use it for wax. They have uh, ratios on their website. It's like 0.4 to one water to plaster or something. For each kilogram of plaster, it's 400 milliliters of water, give or take a little bit. Mix it up, throw it in here under the chamber, crank this to the investment table, turn it on and get all the bubbles out of there. Then pour it into the flask, throw it back in the chamber, degas the flask and then you wait. Just like this sticker says here, uh, don't just turn the pump off with the vacuum in there. Crank this over to vacuum release, let the pressure start going down, then turn it off. This goes for all vacuum pumps. I believe if you screw that up, it ends up sucking the vacuum oil into the lines and it's, it's not a good time. Another tip, don't leave this clear bell on here if you're not using it. You'll see why later. And no, I didn't drop and break it. Obviously, it's still in one piece. So to burn out these molds, you need a burnout oven. Another big piece of equipment. Or a programmable kiln or something. You need to be able to program like temperature ramps and holds. So it'll ramp up at a certain rate and hold at a certain temperature for a number of hours and ramp up again and again. The, the program is on the website for the, for the plaster. I use the plaster directions. Some resins have like their own schedule. I just use the plaster one. It seemed to work. A bunch of you people have been asking me, is there a way to shorten it? Because it takes like a day, it takes forever. Uh, I doubt it. You're just as much burning out the resin and stuff as you are like firing the material, kind of like in pottery. So pottery is measured in heat work, cones. You can get the same amount of heat work with higher temperatures and shorter periods of time or lower temperatures for longer periods of time. There are always trade-offs. I gotta think if there was a way to like shorten it without making any other sacrifices, someone would have figured it out and rolled it out to market already because there are industries using this process and they all wanna save time. They all wanna save energy. There's probably a reason that it takes this long. I'll probably give it a shot in the future anyway because I can't help but screw with stuff that works perfectly fine. But for now, I did it by the book. Yes, programmable burnout ovens are expensive and it takes ages. And you have to time it so that when the burnout's done, it doesn't just turn off and cool down. The temperature cools to a set rate and holds because you need it to be that hot to pour. I use like 600 degrees. I'm just guessing. No one has investment casting advice for people using ZA12 alloy, which is the metal that I'm using. It's not bronze, it's not silver, it's not gold. So anyways, onto the metal, ZA12. It's a zinc alloy with some aluminum in it. I have a lot of it, that's why I'm using it. And I melted it in this. Whew. The electric furnace that you've seen earlier. Now this is important. Investment casting 
is very sensitive to temperature differences. And this is the only way I have here to melt metal really carefully. It heats up to a set temperature and it holds it right there. When I'm using my propane furnace, I, I tend to overheat everything. Uh, and the temperature varies wildly. You can get away with that in sand casting. Sand casting is very forgiving. Investment casting, not as much. So you kind of need one of these. Now the crucibles in those things aren't very big. Your mold isn't very big either. So you really don't need the huge size. Think about it, there's a reason jewelers use vacuum and electric ovens with programmable ramp and hold schedules. It's because they need reliably good results and they're working with gold, so they don't wanna screw up. Just a tip, when the thing says it's up to temperature, it's probably not. The metal inside probably isn't yet. Give it like 15 minutes. Okay, finally to the pour. Just talking through this process is a bit tiring. Ah, uh, I need a tea break. So to use this thing, you take your flask out of the oven and you set it over here. Turn the pump on, crank it over, and the vacuum forms pretty quick and it just sucks it right down. Even the rusted pipe flask worked just fine. While the vacuum's cranking, pour the metal in the top. It should only take a couple of seconds. Now I don't know how long you should leave the vacuum running, but you know, a minute-ish is what I did. Then I turned it to release, turned the vacuum off. Now here's why you don't want the clear bell up here. Turning the vacuum release doesn't like open it to the atmosphere and let the vacuum out. All it does is connect the vacuum to this, the investment table, and to this. So if the bell is up here, it's gonna just suck this down. And there's no one on earth who can take that thing off when there's a total vacuum in here getting sucked down. You'd pick the whole machine up with that bell. Trust me, I made this mistake once. Okay, and finally, when the metal is just solidified but it's not cold yet, take the flask out and dunk it in a bucket of water. The, the cold water hitting the boiling hot plaster will shatter the plaster and kind of clean it out and you can get your part out real easy. This is especially nice with the perforated flask because the, the water can get in all those little holes It's and it sounds awesome if you're into that kind of ASMR stuff. On to the results. I cut off some of the sprues. I didn't do a great job. I was kind of impatient. And then uh, to clean it up, I just kind of hit it with the polishing wheel off a Dremel. Nothing special. I do feel a bit like I ran a marathon here. Not gonna lie. Hope the results are worth all the trouble. Okay, first off, I cast an Amerilabs Test Town. This is a standard resin print test thing. It's to get your resin settings dialed in. It's got a bunch of little details on there. And I thought, why not try it for this test? Here's one I did a while back without a vacuum, like next to what it should look like. You know, I'm surprised it did so well. Like it, was, it, was, it filled in pretty good with little details, but plenty of the tight spaces didn't get filled in. Some of those rings didn't get filled in. None of the little of the little wires got filled in. And here's the one from the vacuum. Every detail is preserved, even the layer lines. Like I, I had anti-aliasing turned off for this. I usually do for test prints. But take a look at these tiny wires. Some of these are too small to print. And any of them that did print, they cast in metal. It's crazy. Freaking incredible. Even the little things like inside the loops, all the loops are filled, it's awesome. Like I can't polish inside every detail, obviously with a Dremel, but you, you get the idea. And how about some rings? I cast a couple of the same rings as I did last time, so we could get like a you know split test, vacuum and knot. I cleaned up just one side of each of the rings so you can kind of see what it looks like right out of the plaster and what it looks like after cleaning up. You know, the vacuum rings clearly filled the mold better. Every little detail came through cleanly, especially the letters. The letters are on the top of the open source ring. Like there's no comparison. The non-vacuum ones, you can read it, but on the vacuum one, like the edges of the font came through better. Both skull rings had some flaws in the face. Probably my fault somewhere, you know, usually is. But the sides look way better on the vacuum one. Even the unpolished, like straight out of the plaster side looks really good. The difference is pretty striking. I tried something new here too. I printed a bunch of these like miniature game pieces. Here's one in a normal resin. These are from a company called One Page Rules. I've mentioned them before. Uh, because their all their prints come with like engineered pre-supports and they're really nice. So if it if it doesn't print nice, it's probably your settings or something. And they have a bunch of these files for free on Calls 3D, which is handy. Now these minis are not designed to be cast in metal. There's like long spindly parts and uneven thickness and and you know other stuff that causes problems. I have no idea how to sprue these things, so I didn't overthink it and just stuck them on. You'd be shocked how often that works around here. Who knows? Just try it. See what happens. Now it's a great way to learn very quickly what not to do. And once you learn all of the things you shouldn't do, whatever's left must be the right way to do it, right? Anyways, I cast these minis in the perforated flask only. Uh, and that's because they're a little too big for that two inch pipe flask. The perforated one's three and a half inch and I needed that extra girth to fit them in there. And after some polishing, they look awesome. Again, I can't get the Dremel polisher like into all the little details. And I may have broken the long gun off this one guy with my clumsy dremeling, but wow, these are cool. Imagine if I had a proper like jewelry polishing setup. 
Now I don't want to take the next six months to print enough of these to make an entire army out of this. Uh, not in zinc anyway. Maybe bronze. Bronze is better. Regardless, I'll have to get some polishing equipment. I literally only have a Dremel and the polishing attachments that come like in the starter kit that comes in the Dremel. And uh, I don't know how good that, that red polishing compound is that comes with it, but clearly it does the job. Not sure there's any way I could have hot glued these into the other sprue. There just isn't enough surface area, especially this robot guy. And speaking of hot glue, one thing I learned, hot glue, though melty, doesn't burn out clean. There's some like residue on the surface, especially of this one dye that I did that resembles uh, when I used the wrong kind of resin. Just because it's melty doesn't mean it's clean burny. So stick to the wax. I think the wax sprues were actually cheaper than a pack of uh, hot glue. So just use the right thing. And remember, every time you're sprueing a thing up, it smells like birthday candles, but with far fewer calories. Fewer than candles? Who eats the candles? You know what I mean. I know this process is like very equipment intensive. And to be honest, I shortcutted a lot of explanation. Uh, but investment casting is kind of like that. Uh, I've included links below of like where you can find a lot of this stuff because I know searching things out can be a real pain. Uh, and it's, it's Black Friday this, well, after this video is released. So a lot of this stuff's probably gonna be on sale. And if I can find coupon codes, I'll put them down below. So if you're interested in any of it, the prices probably won't go down any lower. Next video will be on sand casting. So if you want a less equipment intensive way to cast metal, uh, relatively, tune into that one.